thank you all, first of all, for being here um, for this really exciting conversation about how, alter how autonomous vehicles are going to change the world and the ways that we need to change the world to accommodate them um, and what role we want them to play in our world. Um, we're going to be talking about public policy. Uh, policymakers have struggled to um, to develop a framework for bringing autonomous vehicles into onto our roads. Um, the House of Rep to catch you up quickly. The House of Representatives um, overwhelmingly passed a bill in 2017, uh, which got bogged down in the Senate last year and died there. Um, the Department of Transportation, as you heard from Derek Khan, has published three versions of uh, voluntary guidance, but no binding regulations. Um, so that's kind of the, the uh, environment that we find ourselves in right now. Um, I'm Tanya Snyder. I'm a transportation reporter uh, for Politico Pro. Um, hopefully you all subscribe to Politico uh, Pro Transportation, or at least read Morning Transportation. And if you don't, come talk to me afterwards. Um, and I want to introduce the panel, too. To my left is Tom Adrecki, Vice President of Supply Chain and Logistics for the Grocery Manufacturers Association. Uh, Beth Kegel, Vice President at HNTB and Director of their Smart and Connected Solutions Program. Baruch Feigenbaum, Assistant Director of Transportation Policy at the Reason Foundation. And Giot Chada from the New Urban Mobility Alliance at the World Resources Institute's Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. Uh, she leads NUMO's work to develop partnerships on tech and mobility. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start with this question of not just the ways that we need to transform our cities and places for autonomous vehicles, um, but the way that, that we can put them to work to make our cities and places, the best cities that they can be. Um, you know, we've, we hear a lot about potential benefits and that, that seem to um, solve a lot of the most vexing issues that cities have about congestion, emissions, safety, access, mobility. Um, how can cities best put these to work so that, you know, we are not just sort of making space to accommodate what industry wants to throw at us, but that we are using them for our, for our own purposes? Can you hear me now? OK, great. That's why it helps to be flexible. Well, when it comes to uh, one of the things that I'll share with you about my background is prior to coming to HNTB, I was a Florida Transportation Commissioner for seven and a half years. And I led a Chamber of Commerce at the same time for about seven years. So I, I come at this from a little bit of a different perspective, kind of a combination of policy, technology, and then understanding community engagement and economic development and quality of life issues. So first and foremost, I would say we, we heard a lot about, we all here today, we've been educated quite a bit, I think, on, on the things that we've heard. Think about some of the localities out there and how much they do not know and understand. So in terms of what cities can do, cities first and foremost can start to really become educated on uh, the benefits and the risks of what is happening with autonomous and connected technology. Uh, the other thing I would say is to be open to actually bring pilots into your city. I think that's critically important because not only is it something that might help the AV entities, but it also helps you learn more about your city. Uh, where the pitfalls are and things of that nature, where do you need to improve? Uh, Miami and, and Ford had a really great relationship when Ford came in with their AV testing down in Miami, as you might expect, a very congested environment, just an interesting place to test, so great uh, information for all to get. Um, I would also say that collaboration is very, very important. Uh, as a city and even as a county between private and public center, sector entities of, of all kinds. 
Uh, I led a chamber in Palm Beach County. We actually were able to immerse all of our entities in uh, an education about autonomous connected vehicles as well as smart city technologies. When you start bringing together not only elected officials and administrators from cities, not only uh, private sector participants, uh, including hospitals and, and others, you start bringing all of them together along with the Urban League and what have you, you really start to get an education about how these in advancements can really advance a locality and be better for a quality of life and I heard earlier competitiveness because we are in a global market and how our quality of life stacks up and what kind of efficiencies we have within our regions and our localities, the more competitive we're going to be as well. Great. Um, whoever wants to take it next. Um, I, I think just building on what you said, I think that one of the, the really important things to also consider as a city um, and as you like proactively consider uh, the deployment, like the future deployment of a AV technology, um, is that this is, isn't occurring or isn't going to occur in a vacuum. Um, and so there are many different things happening sort of all at the same time, right? So if you have um, just the, the tremendous sort of growth and, and demand for e-commerce delivery, for example, I, in, prior to my role at GMA, um, was the director of urban innovation and mobility at UPS. And so I would talk to cities all the time about just the, the tremendous influx of demand that uh, curb spaces is, is, you know, the, and the sort of the strain of that physical real estate asset in a city and how that's, that, that demand shift is, shift is happening. Um, you have the emergence of micro mobility, you have the emergence of TNC, like all of these things are happening. And so you can't, I, I think, just say, say like, well, let's take the AV bucket or let's just take the TNC development. All of this is happening at once. And so um, as a city, I think you need to adopt this very sort of like integrated uh, proactive view. So I would say, I think one of the, the questions is what about cars? Because obviously cities have got concerns about congestion uh, and about mobility, and as, as was mentioned about the curb space, because it's gonna be a lot of competition. And so our approach at Reason, not surprisingly, is a free market approach, um, has been pricing. And I know it was mentioned a little bit on the past panel, but I think there's a lot you can do with pricing. Uh, if you're worried about zero occupant vehicles, sort of the, uh, the zombie cars, as they're sometimes called, roaming around, then you can price those vehicles higher. If you want to encourage carpooling, uh, you can price those vehicles lower or not at all. Now, we don't have a great history for carpooling in this country. There's a lot of hope, and Alan Kornhauser at Princeton has spoken on this, for those of you familiar with him, that with some of the automated vehicles and the improvements with ride sharing and what we see even today with smartphones, there's going to be a lot more of that. We also have to talk about the 800-pound uh, gorilla, which is transit. And obviously, in some metro areas, New York, D.C., others, transit as we have it now works okay. I'm not going to go quite as far as Cliff went and said it's a, it's a total disaster. But um, <laughs> it, it needs a lot of improvement in a lot of places, and it's not great. And I think automated vehicles can do a lot of that in terms of maybe getting rid of the labor costs down the road, uh, looking at smaller vehicles, right sizing. I think partnerships uh, with the, the private sector is going to be important as well, working with Uber and Lyft for some of the low density routes. We say that already with first mile and last mile. Uh, so I, I think uh, pricing for cars and figuring out how we can make transit better are, are two important things. Um, is that on? Is it? Okay, um, so I think um, I'll focus a little bit on one, what Tom brought up, which is uh, on micromobility. And I'll just take a quick, quick poll. How many of us have been on a shared scooter or a shared cycle? Okay, that, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the point of view that I, I think I'm coming from is that today we have that opportunity to start flexing our muscle and start to um, have discussions and pilot and experiment on the topics that will be important um, when AVs are eventually on our roads, um, today itself with micromobility. So some of the topics that are hot with micromobility right now is the use of space and the allocation of space is, is pricing, as you're saying, and, and thinking about what are the different models behind that uh, around regulation regulation, around permits, uh, thinking about market entry. And I think we really do have that opportunity today to, to start um, <coughs> laying some of that groundwork for when AVs um, are, are actually on our streets. Um, where micromobility and AVs differ, though, I think, is that 
in the current ecosystem that we have today, AVs could very well fit into the space that we have for personal cars. Um, and I think that we do have the opportunity today, cities and, and other stakeholders do need to come together and think about like how do we use this this moment in time to really think about the goals for our cities and what sort of cities we're trying to trying to um, uh, you know live in. Um, so we we would really push for cities uh, that are active and are shared in terms of mobility. So thinking about a 20 minute neighborhood, um, we think that um, clearly land use and planning plays a really big part of making that happen. Uh, but a lot of these new mobility entrants are starting to. Um, add to the possibilities in that space. So I really think that um, engaging on the topics that are at hand today uh, gives us that platform to be able to get our cities into a position that we have the right uh, sort of infrastructure, we have the right public-private partnerships, uh, we have the right um, um, uh, mode choices uh, that we would want uh, for different types of trips and different types of purposes and different types of populations. <laughs> Um, picking up there a little bit, how as we as we think about remaking our infrastructure for a new autonomous era, how do we avoid some of the um, mistakes of the highway era, where um, highways were built through low-income neighborhoods, where they accelerated sprawl? How do we make sure that we are working um, sustainability and social equity into that infrastructure? Well, going back to the point that I said, you have to start looking at that data uh, and the statistics and putting them at the forefront to, to really bring that to reality. Uh, one of the things that I would talk about, uh, since I am from Florida and I served on the commission, Florida actually is embarking on its Florida transportation plan and they're putting some of those statistics right front and center with all of the stakeholders that are looking at it. So looking at how many people live within a half a mile of a health, healthy food source, looking at how many live below the poverty, uh, excuse me, the poverty line, how many households uh, do not have a bank account. Actually, 8.4 million households in our country do not have a bank account. Uh, transportation in Florida is the third highest household cost for a family. 56.5% uh, of our residents live within a half a mile of fixed route transits. So that means the rest of them don't. So we're actually putting those issues at the forefront and having those discussions so that that is part of our overall transportation and smart city planning. So social equity is becoming uh, more and more a hot topic. I mean, it's a national discussion relative to this and, and others. So the more leadership that's taken within our communities and our states and et cetera on this, the more we'll include those in our solutions. I guess I will just say, um, to be a little contrarian here, after the first answer, we have to realize, obviously, the highway building era had some real problems in terms of building through neighborhoods. I mean, there's a situation in Atlanta where there's a highway that actually takes a curve when going straight would have been the cheaper and more direct route because they were trying to separate the low-income minority from the central business district. That's a pretty awful policy, and we certainly want to find ways that we don't do that um, in anything, really, again. Uh, and I, I think looking at the overall costs, you know, in some ways, the federal government can actually be a problem here because to the extent that it is incentivizing certain policies, when it was incentivizing highway construction with a large federal share, uh, cities were sort of uh, doing, uh, and states were doing, what the policy designed them to do, which is build roadways, even if it wasn't necessarily to logical places or it wasn't the most cheapest the cheapest place um, because there was that incentive there. And so we have to make sure we're tapping the right federal incentives. But I will say we don't want to forget that highways and roads in general move the vast majority of folks, certainly lower in cities and certainly lower in D.C. and New York than in other places around the country. But even if the automated vehicles are shared, they are still going to be on roadways, and we have to make sure we have sufficient capacity for that. Um, I think to add to these points, uh, I'd also say that and I'm sure this has been covered in depth through the day, sorry I couldn't be here earlier, um, but that we have the opportunity today to just rethink what a vehicle looks like as well. And many of 
of you in the room are engaged with that. And so we have that choice to think about um, uh, wheelchair accessible, service animals. H how are we going to build vehicles to allow for that, that level of access for all? Um, but I, I think the, the, the point also goes back towards is there political will? Uh, is there general will? Uh, what is our mindset uh, ar ar around these topics? Um, and on the subject of like political will, I think that, and I'm going to go a little philosophical on this, but I think that uh, part of like demonstrating political will is also the ability to, to sort of step back and to say that um, like you don't make infrastructure equitable, you start with equity uh, and then you would, you would sort of sort of underline or, or sort of think through, well, what is it that you even want to achieve in the first place or do you need that infrastructure to make that connection. It's sort of like you start with that equity goal and then you're finding ways of moving people around um, rather than just be like, well, we need to build a bunch of roads um, because we need AVs. Oh, well, by the way, we need to incorporate equity as a part of that. Um, I think it's just like a, a philosophical reorientation. I think that's what I was trying to get at with that first question also of, you know, what, what are the problems that we're trying to solve and we figure that out first and then figure out how AVs can help solve those problems rather than say, they're coming. <laughs> what do we do? Um, I wanted to ask, uh, maybe at the risk of fixating too much on Tesla, um, you know, Tesla's had several high profile uh, fatalities. Um, Uber, obviously, the self driving car that hit a pedestrian uh, last March. Um, how have these very high profile and, and understanding that, you know, we have 37,000 deaths on our roadways every year, but these get a lot of attention. How do these incidents change or impact the approach that cities are taking? Uh, to the cities or states are taking to, to regulating or embracing driverless technology. Start with you, Beth. I want to look at this first from a little bit of a different angle um, because we heard earlier today about how the, uh, the OEMs are responding to this as well. I think what this is doing is this is raising significant awareness that uh, this is not as basic and as simple as many thought. I mean, when you're when you're trying to replicate the human mind and the decision ma this decisions that are being made that way, it's very complicated. So actually, in talking to some some of these OEMs, they have uh, pulled back and they have really intensified their testing processes. Some of them have their own tracks, in fact, and they're putting them through much more uh, rigorous testing. And uh, one of the things that I think is recognized, uh, we actually did a national survey that dealt with a number of items, including public acceptance. So we found out that 52% uh, 50, uh, of the people that we surveyed with the national sample pool actually um, believe that the greatest uh, benefit from all of this is increased mobility for non-drivers. So, that's a number one benefit, and then uh, safety is second. But how the public actually responds, whatever their first experience is, with an autonomous vehicle or any of these other modes that we're talking about is going to really shape things. So just like we heard earlier, if there is a fatality with an AV that's being tested on a road, that's going to affect the whole industry. So there's pullback on that side. I think we're seeing uh, a little bit more patient, uh, patience uh, within our communities and on the public sector side and appreciation of that. So I would say, to directly answer your question, I hope they don't. Because I know it's easy to look at something like the Uber crash and say, boy, this is a dangerous technology and we shouldn't do it. But as has been po was pointed out in the last panel, 37,000 lives a year is a lot of people that die. And even if automated vehicles are able to reduce that by 50%, that is still a tremendous improvement. Now, I don't, th we, we all hear the statistic, I guess it's 94% of crashes are caused by humans. And the reality is that while a lot of those will be gotten rid of, probably not all of them, and AVs may introduce some new crashes. So I don't, I don't want to be too Pollyanna here on the, on the options, but I do think a 50% improvement is better. And I do think it would be helpful if there was some, some federal 
uh, the legislation, the, the Self-Drive Act, I happen to think it was a good bill. It wasn't perfect. Now, I can say there were folks on both sides of the spectrum, uh, folks who thought it went too far, and also someone who's worked on AVs for a while, um, whose name I will withhold, that said it thought it was an abomination. Uh, that being said, passing legislation is very challenging, and I think it would be a good start because the federal government is the one that has traditionally done with safety, whereas the states do with licensing. And I think if we introduce new dynamics where states and local governments are specifically looking at the safety of vehicles, I think that's problematic for a lot of reasons, including the number of different modifications that the OEMs would need to make to vehicles. I think just just adding to that uh, to the to the good point that you were making, um, you know, you you look at the number of deaths that are or accidents that have taken place with AVs, and that's in the well, you can you can count them on your hands um, <laughs> or one hand. Uh, you look at the number that are caused by you know when you're or when you're walk or when you're on a cycle or on a scooter, uh, you know, and and then you sort of like in scooters you're probably getting to around the tens, and then cycles uh, and 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 cars and pedestrians goes up uh, a lot higher. And it's it's always interesting to see the uproar that's caused by by the one or the two uh, versus just the complacency with, with the everyday. Um, but uh, aside from that, I think that it's also interesting, I, I, I can't speak for Tesla, but I think it's interesting with some of these other uh, new mobility companies like Uber and Lyft uh, about how they're becoming uh, not a ride-hailing company but a platform company, right? So aside just from the, the new modes that they're in, uh, bringing into their platform and the new modes that they're trying to Invent. Um, uh, it, it's also, uh, the, you know, the um, the one-stop shop for you to get your information and make your travel decisions, to make your purchases for transport as well. And I think that when companies start thinking in that sort of holistic way about the, the entire transport ecosystem, uh, that starts to position them, or I'm hoping that starts to position them differently in the minds of people rather than honing in on only, only like that one accident uh, that took place. Not to minimize any death, but um, I think that, that that sort of thing is taken out of context, out of proportion. Um, I want to ask also, um, and Baruch, we'll start with you, because uh, I want to ask about federal regulation. Um, Obviously, a, a, uh, a lot of people think that, that the bad PR that goes along with a fatality is, is enough incentive for, uh, for OEMs, for AV developers, to wait until the technology is ready. And like you said, how, re when is it ready is, a, is a, an open question because, you know, even if they're going to improve things, but it's not, you know, they haven't worked out all the kinks, if they're going to make it 50% safer, maybe it's ready. Putting that aside, um, a lot of people also look at it and say, you know, when we're looking at corporate accountability, we also have Takata airbags, we also have VW emissions cheating, you know, a can we rely solely on corporate self-policing. Um, is there a role for the federal government to sign off on these vehicles before, uh, and I realize that this, is, that this is something that no one in the federal government seems to have much appetite for, but I think that when we see the kind of reservations that the public has about this, um, maybe it's a conversation worth having. Sure, yeah, I, I, I think that's a very good question. and couple thoughts. There are some, obviously the state of California requires certain things that the automakers have to do, and many of them are, are in fact testing there. And there is the self-certification platform where the automakers do have to show that their vehicles are testing, and the federal government does have to approve that. So there's a little bit of that. And, and should there be more? And I guess I would say not at this time. And there's a couple reasons for that. So first of all, the Uber crash was awful. And I think nobody was more upset with it than me. And the reason I was upset with it is because I really believe that these companies have a responsibility to put safe products on the road. And clearly that's not what was going on. This Uber vehicle was clearly not ready for prime time. The good news is I think the market and also the state of Arizona punished them for that action that I think was honestly a far more punishment than they would have gotten from the federal government if that was the only thing they could have gotten. 
And the other challenge goes back goes back to the, your part of your question, which is, does the federal government know when these vehicles are safe enough? How do you prove that? How do you weigh the cost benefit of potentially a loss of life here versus getting the car on the road sooner and doing the loss of life there? I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't have confidence that the government would have enough information to actually weigh that correctly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the uh, the federal the Senate is about to mark up their uh, five year reauthorization bill. And getting back to infrastructure, Derek Kahn said infrastructure <coughs> is um, not an enabler, but potentially a blocker. That it is something that can get in the way of the uh, the deployment of autonomous vehicles, though it can't necessarily kind of um, conjure them. Uh, you know, if we're if we're about to set policy for the next five years of um, highway policy in the United States, what what should the Senate, what should Congress be looking at now um, that that in the next five years will need to happen? Well, um, they might be able to. Look at what the state of Florida is doing, in fact. I know I keep going back to that, and I promised I would. <laughs> okay, I keep going back to Tesla. <laughs> but actually, uh, if you take a look at what Florida is doing, uh, now legislation has been enacted and projects uh, are being uh, sought to actually embed the technology in new infrastructure. So when we're looking at long-range planning, this is something that should be a part of that. And you know, we, we've talked a lot about um, the life-saving elements of this. Well, if we're really going to be serious about it, we're going to start including these things in our, in our long-range planning, including things that, that have to do with the electrification of vehicles and expecting those on our roadways, for example. So in looking at long-range transportation plans, how do you address that? And, and if that's the way uh, uh, the automobiles are going for various reasons, and you have to ensure that the infrastructure can support that, you have to uh, find ways uh, to start being forward-thinking about how do you handle uh, things such as hurricanes that we heard before under those under those circumstances. Uh, so, so these are some things that can be looked at in transportation planning. Also, we had a discussion about 5.9 gig that happened earlier. What kind of leadership role can the Senate play in that to ensure safety over the long term uh, and what have you? So I would say there's currently grant programs right now for a lot of the smart infrastructure that I, I know Beth has, Beth has been talking about. And I think those are important, and I think those should continue. That's obviously separate from the six-year authorization bill, but I still think that's, that's important. Uh, I also think there's value in the so-called dumb infrastructure, which is maintaining your roadways, making sure your lines are painted. And uh, Kirk Steidel, who was former Michigan DOT uh, secretary, brought up a good point, which is that, well, if you're in a cold weather place, your lines and your roadway pavement can get chipped pretty badly in the winter. So I think we need to look at some sort of uh, partnership, uh, possibly public-private partnership, where state DOTs are going out and making sure that the maintenance for the self-driving vehicles is actually there. And that's not necessarily just the pavement, but it could also be if there's vehicle to vehicle. I'm personally more of a fan of um, uh, cellular V to X than I am of DSRC. I, I think that's kind of what we'll see where that goes. But I think that is really important. And that has the advantage of not only helping automated vehicles, but actually also helping today's vehicles and, and transit vehicles. And so shouldn't be challenging from a political perspective. Um, and just to add on a little bit about, you know, like uh, targeting like dumb infrastructure or like taking more of like a, a nuts and bolts approach. But I, I, I do think that there's a, a degree of to which that you can sort of write in um, some degree of prioritization around um, specific 
uh, it could be a freight pinch point. It could be particular areas where where spending money matters. And so a lot of states have done done this in terms of like right sizing infrastructure projects and thinking about well, what is currently in the pipeline and, and do you actually need the ninety million dollar project or could you accomplish uh, ninety eight percent of it with a nine million dollar project. Um, and so I think that there's ways of, of sort of building in that philosophy of prioritization and then right sizing um, into to how the actual reauthorization is structured. Um, I, I'll just pick up on the point that Beth was making about hurricanes. And I'm, I'm wondering what the opportunity is to look at uh, funding resilient infrastructure in cities and marrying that with the recreation of transport infrastructure that's needed as well. Um, and I think that um, that that there are um, there is common cause with a lot of these sort of new mobility platform companies that are looking at streets that are uh, slower, that are looking at um, uh, at, at uh, rethinking sort of street allocation. Um, and I, I think that bringing some of these moving parts together can actually sort of spur that forward. Um, I've been sitting here trying to think whether I want to go down the rabbit hole of 5.9 gigahertz that you brought up, Baruch, and I, let's go there for a minute. Um, so, uh, so the FCC is still kind of in this decision-making process about whether to reserve this kind of safety band for vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure, uh, transportation, communications, uh, it's very underused right now. There's also this kind of uh, raging debate about what is the right, uh, maybe it's not even raging anymore, maybe it's settled that, that the original DSRC technology that the federal government had sort of chosen uh, is not the right one. DOT now wants to be tech neutral, and aside from that, most of industry uh, has embraced a new technology. Um, so right now, DOT has just chosen to stay out of it. They're not uh, they're, they're, they, they have kind of frozen rulemaking on that. Is that the most helpful thing for them to do, to just stop? Or do they need to, at some point, just say, this is the policy and move forward? Because it does seem like, like this um, limbo is, is more harmful than, uh, than having new policy. So the answer to your question is yes. Uh, for the time being, I would say, because I don't think it's settled, that they should stay out of it. But yes, at a certain point in time, and of course I wish I could tell you when that time is and I don't know, we, we do need to choose a technology because we can't just go on this forever. I think the rationale for staying out of it right now is that as it stands currently, DSRC would be more effective because 5G Vita X is not ready for prime time. But many people expect that within a few years, uh, 5G uh, with Vita X is going to be the better technology. But because, of course, we can't predict the future and we don't know, I think we shouldn't be making a decision just yet. And there are, I, I don't want to trash DSRC because there are advantages of DSRC. Your, Europe is doing a lot with it. It's just, when I look at the 5G VS DSRC, DSRC is going to require a lot of government funding and spending. And at a time when, honestly, we don't really do a good job of maintaining our roads, sort of the classic, I just don't see the political support there. I, I really don't. I, it could be a great technology in a laboratory, but in the real world, I have some concerns. And I think with 5G and Vita X, you can get the private sector to pick up a lot of those costs, and it's a benefit. I would say I am generally supportive of keeping the wireless spectrum in the DOT. Now, I do think at a certain point in time, we need to show in the transportation sector that we're really going to make good use of it because obviously there's there's competing uh, demands right now, but I'm not just willing to cede it uh, to the FCC because it hasn't been used yet. Um, but I do think we need to make some progress there. Um, I, I'm curious also about sort of the role of the, the private sector um, and partly in, in um, some of the infrastructure upgrades, perhaps electrification upgrades um, that need to happen to prepare for the autonomous era. Um, 
you know, is that something that the federal government should be doing, or is that something that the that the private sector, that these companies need to do themselves if they want to roll out, uh, for example, electric vehicles, that they should be in charge of figuring out how to also roll out electric vehicle charging stations? Is that, whose job is that? Well, I, I don't know that it's limiting, that it has to be the private sector or the public sector. Um, I think it can also be partnerships between the private sector and public sector. It's just like uh, we were talking about before. There are certain conditions and situations that uh, for electric vehicles and electric charging stations, if those are going to be installed and you have a significant amount of your population dependent on that, then you have to make sure that you have uh, a resilient infrastructure that can accommodate that. So when it comes to uh, the, the overall resiliency and, and safety, that's usually something that is a public sector responsibility. But I think you can work very closely in partnership with the private sector because there are definitely some benefits. Uh, even benefits from the standpoint of uh, if you're implementing infrastructure that includes sensing technology and data collection te technology and whatnot, that data that's collected can be very valuable also to the private sector. And that goes to a whole other discussion about data generation, data sharing, you know, who owns it, that, that sort of thing. But I'm not so sure that that is a singular answer. I think there can be a tremendous amount of partnership in that. And, and I think it, in, inherently it, it almost has to be uh, a partnership. Um, charging, like fast charging are class eight uh, tractor trailer uh, essentially requires the same amount of energy that's that's used in a single day to power a Walmart. Um, so, like, even if you were going to have a fleet of Class A trucks, right, like you, you sort of need exponential uh, demand that you're putting on the power grid, which which would seem to imply that if, um, like, let's say my former employer UPS was wanted to to roll out a bunch of trucks, um, we might need to coordinate with the utility and and you know the city and, and others to to sort of um, create a, an environment that's actually conducive to us doing that. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of interplay and, and potential to, to work hand in hand um, to bring different technologies online and sort of, you know, structure rates appropriately and um, just provide that infrastructure where necessary. Yeah, in theory, uh, the private sector should do it, but I see nothing wrong with public-private partnerships along the lines that those just mentioned. I think those are a win-win, and I think those are a great way to get it done. Uh, that's an interesting question, and I was thinking back to two examples. One was Bird's announcement to uh, allocate a billion dollars last year. They made that announcement towards the creation of uh, bicycle lane infrastructure in cities. Um, I'm sure a lot of you remember that, and then how, I think, six months later, if I remember correctly, that, that program w was closed. And, and not, not to point out uh, BIRD in particular, but I think that there is skepticism uh, um, and maybe healthy skepticism when private sector is, is pushing uh, for some of these infrastructure changes. But then on the other hand, you, know, you, you read uh, cases about how some of these uh, new mobility companies are working with local communities uh, that, are, that have been historically neglected in terms of transit investment uh, and how they're working at, at quite a grassroots level to help bring infrastructure, whether it's the docked bicycles or other types of infrastructure into those communities. Um, so, so I think that um, that you're right. It it is uh, it's probably not a straightforward or an easy answer, and it does have to come through uh, coordination and through partnerships. Um, talking about uh, public-private partnerships, um, Ford has a partnership with DC right now to introduce some autonomous vehicles. These are happening all over the country. Um, what will it take for some of these? I think it's important that folks get out and experience the technology. One of the things we've seen is if you ask a survey of pe people and what they think of autonomous technology, most folks are usually negative. And they're negative because what gets the coverage is what happened in Arizona, as opposed to the number of successful rides that another one does, because that's really not very interesting or newsworthy. 
But we find that when folks actually ride in these vehicles and find that they're, you know, not altogether different from today's vehicles and they're not taking them around corners at 50 miles an hour and crashing them into other vehicles, they become much more supportive. So I think the pilots can sort of build on themselves. And I think it's important that the pilots go to different places in the city, not just one select. I know oftentimes it can be easier just to geofence it and put it in one place to start. And I think that makes sense. And obviously, many of these vehicles are what they call level four on the Society of Automotive Engineers scale. They're not going to be everywhere. But moving them around to different neighborhoods to increase support, I think, is really important. And I'll just add to what Baruch said. I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and also to have those sustainable, uh, when I say sustainable, I'm not necessarily talking about environmental, I mean sustainable from a longevity standpoint, those uh, sustainable pilots are really important for information sharing. Uh, just as I said before, there's a lot for both parties to learn when you do that, and then the public engagement is, is very, very important. Uh, even if you look at uh, some of our communities, uh, those that are 65 and older, and as you get to a point where maybe you lose your ability to be independent and you rely on others for mobility, when you can start to expose those members uh, of, our, of our cities and our states uh, in the technology and they can experience it, it definitely helps with public acceptance and trust. And that is probably one of the, one of the biggest factors uh, that will either enhance or impede rolling this out. So I, I completely agree with what Baruch said. Um, I'd add um, and say that in addition to these pilots or in conjunction with these pilots that I'm hoping that there are there is robust discussion around what are the goals that those cities uh, are trying to achieve. So not just simply procuring a widget, but rather thinking about what is the, the challenge and, and what is the solution that they're, they're hoping um, to, um, to experiment around. Um, I'd also say that it's, it's important to sort of think about the, the current mix of modes in that city and, and not only where the goals of that city are, but what does this look like in a city like DC where 40% of the population don't have cars versus other cities in the US where 10% where, where of the population don't have cars? Uh, just really quickly, from a, from a pilot perspective and making it actually last well into the future, I think we also sometimes have a tendency to want um, I think the, like the idealized version of aut autonomous vehicles to be what's piloted uh, rather than what is perhaps very practical in the short term and very executable on a repeating basis. And so if you look at things like some, uh, and, and it's not true like full AV, of course, but like uh, automation at ports, um, it, very implementable, um, achievable, repeatable, uh, and, and can be scaled to different places. And then I think that doing things like that also those builds slow acceptance over time of increasing automation. Um, that it doesn't just have to be like immediately you will be able to go everywhere in an autonomous Uber. Um, Jyot, I also want to open some space. You, uh, Numo works at a global level. You just moved back from India. Um, I, I would just love to hear what you're seeing around the world, where, we, where we've been focusing a lot on the United States and kind of what you're seeing around the world as uh, places are beginning to wrestle with this, this new uh, emerging technology. Thanks. Um, I think in, in the global south, the rise that we're seeing of... Um, of ride hailing has been very interesting, especially um, where the, the, the entire population doesn't have access to formalized banking products or uh, even sometimes internet access on their phones. I think mobile phone penetration is, is quite good in, in cities in the Global South at this point. Uh, and so it's interesting to see these new products that are coming out. Um, and I'd love to see some of those being tested over here as well for, for unbanked populations. So that's one piece. There's, I think, a very big question around uh, how to regulate those models. Um, but I, I think maybe the, the, the base um, uh, the entry point of this discussion is fundamentally different from the entry point of this discussion in the U.S., which is that the majority of trips, for example, in a city like Bombay, are done by walking. 50% of trips is walking. Then of the motorized, another 50% is public transport. And so you get down to about like 8 maybe or 10% of trips that are being made by car. And so in... Um, 
in an ecosystem like that, where these cities are undergoing massive changes, uh, new populations coming into the city, you know, a lot of growth potential, a lot of, you know, many aspirations for people to enter the middle class, where a vehicle has been that uh, that traditional way to show that you have entered the middle class. Uh, you know, I think that there are very big questions about, well, is this are these new models sort of substituting for uh, people wanting um, to to own their own vehicle? Um, or is it actually um, um, shifting how people think about moving around? Um, but also fundamentally, the capacity of cities in the global south is a lot lower to be able to deal with a lot of these changes. So uh, you know, the, the handoff of what would be done by the public sector and the private sector, I think, is a bit more stark over there. Um, Aside from that slightly depressing story, <laughs> I think that there are also just really exciting things happening um, around how we think about informal transit and paratransit in African cities, in Indian cities, um, data standards that are being developed off of those, uh, how we're thinking about uh, you know, utilizing uh, motorcycles as taxis uh, as well, very large operations of those uh, emerging. So th there's a lot of innovation that's taking place um, but I would say just fundamentally it looks a bit different than what's happening in the U.S. because of that, that, that mix, which is very different, and the affordability, which is very different. Sorry. I'm kind of reeling from the uh, mode share that you just described in India. I mean, 50% walking, 8% single occupancy. Uh, single occupancy vehicle, if those even were single occupancy, um, is some is just so opposite from where we are. Um, and Baruch, you also mentioned how uh, autonomous technology can be helpful in transit. I think that uh, a lot of there's a lot of concern that autonomous technology like TNCs can um, increase congestion because when if if um, taking your own door-to-door uh, -door vehicle uh, is is the most is the cheapest, most efficient, most accessible way. Then then what are the incentives not to do that? Um, so I would love to hear more about how um, autonomous technology is going to get us closer to 50% walking and 8% single occupancy vehicle, uh, and you know, and 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 is going to actually um, help the transit sector instead of um, rendering it obsolete. Sure. Well, I don't think we're ever going to get to 50% walking in, in those modes, except maybe, sort of maybe a joke, in but New York City. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Well, just didn't want to get anyone's hopes up for that. Um, so first of all, as, as, as I think I mentioned, I really believe pricing is the key. There's been a lot looked at urban growth boundaries, um, changing land use, and, and all of that can, can work in certain situations. But what we found is that what folks are most sensitive to is cost. That's what makes them change their mind. They're not at least by and large sensitive to nice societal goals as much as we might want them to. Uh, folks generally tend to be kind of selfish. Sorry for that downer, that's just kind of the reality. So I think that's important. I would also say we may need to change our mind on what we consider transit. Certainly in core DC, in core New York, the heavy rail lines are never going away. But in a lot of places where there, we have bus, uh, I'm a big fan of BRT. Um, sometimes I even look at, look at BRT. That may not be the future. The future may be smaller vehicles. The future may be, in fact, cars where we actually have four people in them as opposed to 1.1 people in them, which is basically what we have now. And I think transit agencies and everyone really has to look at how they can work together. One of the challenges is we've been doing transit for basically the same way for the last 50 years, and ridership is going down, and we're not real good at change because it's hard. Um, and I'm hopeful that automated vehicles and some of these new technologies will be the impetus for folks to actually step out of their, their box. And we are seeing at Jacksonville Transit Agency is actually doing some interesting things. They're testing some AVs instead of their, I think they had a people mover system. So some, some transit agencies are looking at new technologies, which is encouraging. Um, I, I will add a little to that and just say that there's still only, especially as you go into a city, there's only so much physical real estate. Um, and so it's, at some point, you're, you're sort of just talking about if you, know, you can fit X number of people 
in a in a in a on a bus, x number of people in a in a transit line, x number of people in an automated car. Uh, like you sort of are still sort of stuck with some of those limitations, and so I think that that's that that interplay of available real estate, how that real estate is actually used and thought about as a city, like how are you building this infrastructure to facilitate cars? Are you, facil are you aiming to facilitate more walking? And, and the levers that you're pulling as a city plays a role in ultimately whether um, AVs it, you know, cause a decline in transit use or, or actually somehow uh, play a role in encouraging it. Um, I'm gonna talk about curb space too. Um, Tom, you have a, a unique take on this as both a, an urban bicyclist and a UPS driver. Um, and uh, curb space is becoming very um, crowded with uh, Ubers and Lyfts, with bike lanes. Um, there, there's just increasing competition, and it's becoming more of an issue. There have been pilot programs uh, trying to deal with this. Uh, just kind of wanted to hear what what we've learned about how to manage curb space um, in a place where people are uh, less kind of driving their own car and parking it and more being picked up and let off. Um, in case this hasn't come through yet, I tend to like often like take steps back from questions and then like think about it philosophically and then sort of go from there. Um, I, so like my take on this, and I had the luxury uh, and continue to do have the luxury of, of talking with a lot of different DOT officials all across the country, um, thinking about, you know, what do you actually want to achieve? What are your goals? Um, how do you want your city to work and function? And so I uh, just like straight up asking, like, what are your transportation priorities if you just listed them out? And by and large, and rarely have this ever deviated, the answers I get back um, are that they care most about safety. They care about equity. Uh, they care about shared mobility. They care about, um, like basically making sure that their businesses stay in business and they continue to have economic development. And then they, they mentioned single occupancy personal vehicles. And then I asked them, well, well then why does every street in America look ex the exact opposite, right? That there's, there's personal vehicle parking, um, there's probably one loading zone, uh, I might, you know, there's no bus lane or like there, there's some other, you know, impediment to that. I'm gonna die crossing the street uh, and nothing is equitable. So like the, this comes like the the orientation of the curb, and when I think about curb, it, it's it's a political decision ultimately, and it's like demonstrating political will to say like, well, your curb doesn't have to look that way. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, five uh, metered spaces that collect like a dollar in an hour or something like that. You could you could blow up the curb entirely. Um, actually, I think that uh, DC's DOT is actually very progressive in this. One of the the pilots that um, UPS, in conjunction with a startup called Curbflow, launched and just launched actually in DC, um, is to really think about like, well, if you could take like the eight or nine uh, different spaces in a city that were particularly congested, uh, contributing to a lot of uh, double uh, truck parking, um, places like the wharf, if anybody's been down there, um, where it's really just not easy to get around, uh, partially also because of Uber and Lyft drop up, and just say, you know, do we actually need that parking space or do we just turn that entire curb into a giant flex zone essentially and uh, eventually I think the idea in the, I think the, the connection back to autonomous vehicles here is that as you start to think about uh, available curb space at designated times you can integrate that with uh, whatever from an autonomous vehicle perspective so that you know when vehicles are going to arrive you have available curb space for them they're able to use that uh, and then you know get on their way and, and move you know in sort of uh, better manage that curb use uh, accordingly. Um, but I think the ultimate thing, right, is like that you don't need to do things the way that you do things today. Yeah, I will say that like a lot of these issues, this is not necessarily new. It's just being maybe exacerbated by automated vehicles. I mean, we have problems today with, with truck loading and, and, you know, bicycling, bicycling and walking and all the rest of it. I will say, um, little plug here, that I think 25 years ago, um, my boss, Adrian Moore, um, wrote a book actually for Brookings um, that was called Managing Curb Space. And it's kind of cycling back around again. And not surprising, uh, pricing um, has a big part to do with it and who you're going to price and how you're going to do it. And 
uh, to Tom's point, making sure that you're having all of the various users come in there. I think very often cities don't necessarily consider the freight and the private delivery. I mean, we see this a lot um, with designing streets and, you know, you, you want to narrow streets um, because you want to encourage certain uses, which is great. But if your freight trucks can't get in there and make deliveries, that's kind of a problem. So making sure you have the cyclists, the walker, the freight delivery, the people who are going to drive their cars, the Uber, Lyft, taxis, all those folks involved, I think is important. Uh, I want to go to the audience for questions. Uh, does anybody have, oh, good. Um, yes. I wanted to take advantage of Tom here to talk about freight. And, the, and since you're from the Grocery Manufacturers Association especially, because one of the things um, I learned about freight is that the actual delivery driver oftentimes stocks the shelves. So there's this connection that we don't, there's a sort of first mile, last mile between the wholesale and the retail and freight. So from your perspective of logistics and groceries, that's what you're, you know, what are they excited about? What are they skeptical about? What are they rolling their eyes at? What do they think are the big problems? What do you, what can you give us a sort of insight into your industry and this automated vehicles space? Um, and so I'll, uh, uh, just to sort of provide some background or context, um, GMA predominantly represents America's sort of favorite brands uh, that are, make consumer packaged goods. Um, it could be anybody from PepsiCo to Coca-Cola to Procter & Gamble. Um, so there's a diversity of products, not just food items, but also like razor blades and soap. Um, so that accounts for one-fifth of U.S. freight. Um, most of the companies in that space rely on uh, external service providers or, or paying for transportation. They're not ultimately the ones that have their own fleet. PepsiCo is like it's sort of its own beast entirely, and they, and they have their own. Um, but because of that, there's a great deal of beholdenness, I think, to... Uh, an industry that also uh, ATA came out with their sort of annual report yesterday talking about a, tr a truck driver shortage um, that, you know, there's 60,000 fewer truck drivers today than are needed. And then that number will uh, more than double over the next decade. Um, and so I think that from our industry's perspective, as you look to automated vehicles, um, there's, I think, a, uh, a hope and a promise um, just from a purely sort of uh, efficiency perspective from like a how do you sort of rethink supply chains and, and you're talking about a technology that sort of fundamentally can you know you take something that today takes five days in a truck because of uh, hours of service and things like that um, and, it, and it condenses you know five day trip across the country to two days or even less um, so you, you open up sort of this Pandora's box of questions like well could you just completely uh, change your network configurations for supply chains could you um, dramatically sort of change how you do business. From a driver side, um, I also don't think that uh, we talk about autonomous vehicles, what sometimes gets uh, lost in that, and especially around truck driving and like the commercial side of things, is that like there's this assumption that the truck driver just goes away. Um, and, and frankly, I, I think that that's missing the boat somewhat because oftentimes that driver, and this is especially the case when I was at UPS, that driver is either the face of your company or they have many other roles to play, sort of to your point about either stocking shelves or interacting as a receiving capacity, a customer service capacity. And so I think that there's, uh, I think, a real interest in figuring out well, how do you couple that technology that can improve safety and efficiency with then somehow enabling that driver to do uh, more and to provide them with additional skills and training uh, as they go about their work. Other questions? Yes. About regulation, um, I know FDA, for example, regulates all the pharma companies, right? They don't want a pharma company to put a drug in the market before they go through the proper trials. Uh, I think there was, it was mentioned that you don't need the federal government to regulate autonomous cars, but suppose I open a 20 percent company and say, okay, you know, I'm going to go ahead with autonomous cars because I just buy cars from, say, Honda or Toyota and add my own LiDAR technology and put it in the market. Should the government allow me to do that? 
So let me just make sure I, I understand. So basically what you're saying is should the government allow aftermarket technologies to be placed on the car? I mean, or, or... Or, or for that matter, allow anybody to put a car out in the market just because they can self-regulate themselves. Well, I guess I would say, so there's certain standards that vehicles have to submit to today in order to be uh, certified. There, there is a self-certification process. So I don't, I wouldn't say it's true that right now you can put any technology out on the market. And I don't think we'd want to introduce that. I like part of me likes the entrepreneurial aspect of that, but part of me also realizes there's a safety component as well. Uh, I think the process we has, have today works well. It's a little different than how they do it in Europe because it's generally not super onerous for the, the company. And so that allows smaller startups to do it. But there is a little, well, there's more than a little bit. There's a, a safety component of it to make sure what's put out there isn't going to kill people. Other questions? Yes? I knew if I waited long enough, somebody would have one. I'm still not sure that, uh, that uh, how that te te technology will affect the entire population. Technology always coming with the cost. So just I'm thinking about the kind of a case. There's somebody who is making $15 per hour and have two children and have to commute somewhere and also have to pick up the child on the way back and also have to go to grocery shopping. For that kind of person, how uh, for that person will benefit or not benefit how much she, has to, she or he has to pay more or pay less? Are you assuming that uh, autonomous vehicles will be introduced as uh, shared fleets like Uber, as opposed to private car ownership? Mm -hmm. I feel that question. Busy people making multiple trips. What's the best way to do that? I'm sorry? Right. Yeah. So that's a tough question. Uh, I mean, in, in okay. So when we're looking at technology, at least my approach is I'm looking if there's overall societal gain. Are some people going to lose and some people going to win? Probably in just about everything in life. Like trying to make everything better for everybody is pretty challenging. But I do think if you look at the shared model, which seems to be how most people think AVs are going to roll out, at least for, for early. And I do think, I personally do think there's going to be individuals owning AVs and probably more than we think, but that certainly does not need to be the model for everybody. And I think if you look at the shared model, because the costs of vehicle ownership are so much less, and the vehicles might not even be owed by folks using them, they might actually be some sort of lease, there may be companies that are actually using them, I think that that is going to have a significantly lower economic cost, at least over the long run. Now, the challenge you bring up is how about folks that need to make trips during the day? Are the vehicles going to be available to them? And that's challenging. That's one of the one of the questions folks are looking at with these shared vehicles is if everyone leaves work at five o'clock, are there going to be enough vehicles and how do you guarantee that? And I honestly think that's a little bit tricky. I think that's one of the reasons individually owned vehicles will be available. But I do think there is a lot more potential. And there's also, we have programs right now uh, that are used uh, if, if folks, for example, take transit one way, but the transit doesn't operate back um, or they're in, they're in, um, van pools, which are where 7 to 14 people share a ride, things called guaranteed ride home, where there's a way to get home or get someplace if they need to. So I think we can expand those type of things. I think we can make it work. I'm not saying we've got it solved right now, but I, I think uh, it's, it's a very promising technology, and I do think it can make uh, driving more affordable for folks. People can all leaving work at... Oh, something to that? 
Sorry. Sure, of course. I, I think your, your question is, uh, is um, prompting me to think about an inclusive design process. Um, and I, I think the private sector is much better at this uh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, but when, uh, when, when you look at how a lot of uh, transit options or how cities are planned, I think that the trips that you're mentioning are not at the forefront uh, for um, for planning those systems, and so I very much agree with you that 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 design process needs to be much more inclusive if we're really going to, you know, push for for uh, transport um, that is accessible and and useful um, for all. I think that that gets to the point also of you know what if we put equity first and framed all of this as we're trying to solve a problem of equity, we can add on top of that also congestion, we can add on top of it mobility, um, you know, and then, you know, and then what is the best way for that, you know, parent of two working uh, a $15 an hour job to, to get around. Um, I also wanted to get back to Baruch's point about uh, the, you know, everyone leaving at five o'clock, will there be enough eagles? I mean, that's a nightmare now. You know, that is, an, that is a, a failure of our transportation system and a failure of our ability to, to work around it. I mean, you know, that's a, you know, if, if people just had more staggered work times, um, so, much of, so many of our transportation problems could be solved. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, and, and we've tried things. I mean, we've obviously tried to incentivize carpooling to get folks to carpool, and it's a little better in the D.C. region because the congestion is so bad. But by and large, um, we've not been super successful. I, I, as someone who gets to work from home a lot, don't understand why folks aren't willing to go in an hour earlier or stay an hour later to uh, avoid the peak congestion. And I know it's sometimes not that easy. You've got to pick a child up from daycare, whatever. But um, again, not to be a broken record, but I think looking at pricing, I mean... <laughs> taking the, the I-66 lanes, for those of you who are local and familiar with that. Now, the ones in the morning um, are a bit of a challenge, and it has to do with some geometric design issues where you've got to merge from four lanes to two lanes and also getting into D.C., so, okay. But the ones in the afternoon, I'm, I still support them, by the way. Happy to talk to you about why. The ones in the afternoon, though, are really wonderful. And if you look at it, a relatively minor price of or no, maybe 50 to 75 cents per mile, has basically gotten rid of all of the congestion on I-66 westbound, got leaving, going from D.C. out to Fairfax County where I live. And it's actually kind of amazing because it's really not that much in the context of, of D.C. And, and honestly, a lot of the incomes here are fairly high, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and the problem, the biggest problem is what happens when the pricing ends and you have congestion before and after because everyone is trying to avoid paying the price, which I totally get, but if you priced it 24 seven, you would not have this problem. So there's a lot we can do with policy. I realize the political acceptance is very, very challenging, um, but we can't, to your point, we can solve these problems if we really want to, I think. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm an urban planning student interning at the Federal Highway Administration who comes from a really rural part of the country. And um, while we have talked today a lot about these um, issues in urban places, it has also been alluded to that this too may change the form in rural areas. Um, and so I'm just curious from your broad range of expertise and perspectives here, um, how you guys see this playing out in more rural areas in the U.S.? It's going to be different. And I guess one of the questions is by mind is, Will there be enough of a enough folks going to similar locations where the ride sharing is going to work, or is it going to be more individually owned vehicles? I mean, it's definitely going to be more individually owned. That, that's just reality. And obviously, there's been some talk of electrification, and, and I do think uh, Tesla says a lot of stuff, but their success with the Model Three in terms of the demand and also producing it makes me fairly optimistic for electrification. So I think that's that's positive there, assuming the power source, of course. 
Um, we don't know is a question. We think for the exurban areas, there's going to be quite a bit of ride sharing. I think for the rural areas, um, I don't know. Maybe some of the new models can work to improve the transit service in the rural areas, which is, you know, basically non-existent um, or, you know, I mean, you, you could actually do a lot with dial a ride sort of type. But it's going to be very different. And I think you bring up a good point. And I think it's going to come to the urban areas first before it gets to the rural areas. But that's obviously a politically sensitive topic. Um, with the few seconds that we have left, I just want to ask what your biggest worries are. Um, I don't know if this is a few second answer. But, you know, as, as we approach... Uh, Right now, with, with very little regulation, as we approach uh, the, the advent of the driverless era, what keeps you up at night? Um, that we, after, after all of this, that we still end up with a transportation system that is the second highest household expense that results in many deaths, <laughs> uh, that uh, is a big contributor to um, emissions. I have a two-part answer. Um, not surprisingly, I, I'm worried more about overregulation, certainly not right now, but in the future. And I also worry that we will not take this opportunity to do things such as congestion pricing that could um, be a big benefit. One of the things that I do think about has to do with funding. Uh, funding of overall transportation infrastructure, especially when we're going with the electrification of vehicles. And I think we have a great opportunity here because we're talking about a lot of innovation. And as we're talking about innovation and also as we might be moving towards uh, shared mobility and whatnot, we should really look innovatively as to how, how we actually fund infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's been challenging particularly because we have states that do their own level of funding, and then we have the federal government that's also responsible for funding. So as states are experimenting in different, strat uh, different strategies uh, to be innovative, we also have the federal government who covers the sphere of the entire country, and we could have the ability of different, different methods being used in different places, and that could create challenges for us. Um. I wish I could tell you that like political decisions were made just on the basis of fact and like uh, complete logic and like that that was so I think that my fear is that uh, sort of like political realities and uh, the sort of you know the desire of people to appease other people um, gets in the way of some of the decisions that are crucially needed. Um, it could be to Baruch's point about congestion pricing or um, some other you know mechanisms of of changing transportation. Um, but it can also be about just like the way that things are rolled out. And so if it's more politically viable in the short term uh, to have a, a personal uh, vehicle uh, regulatory approach for, um, for autonomous vehicles rather than commercial applications, which I actually, um, and this maybe just, you know, yes, I represent GMA, but I think that there's more viable short term options for commercial autonomy than there are for personal autonomy. Um, and, but that's not a politically uh, viable thing necessarily to say. And so I think that the, the sensitivity there would have to be that um, just that you don't let politics get in the way of, of uh, actual progress. Well, that does it for us. Please join me in thanking the panel uh, for this wonderful conversation. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.